Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Yeah, so we have uh, Sam here today from MIT. Uh, he joined MIT in 2004. Uh, he'll be talking about the Cartel project. So. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, guys, for having me. Um, so I'm going to talk today about work we've been doing for the last, um, I guess, three years now on this Cartel project. Um, this is a joint project with uh, my colleague Hari Balakrishnan, who I'm sure many of you know, um, and a giant pile of students and uh, staff people and other folks. Um, Every time I give this talk, I sort of have to think about all the people, and I have to add new names to this list. So, um, Anyway, so the motivation for the Cartel Project has sort of started, and we've spent a lot of time doing sensor networking research at, uh, at both at MIT and before I was at MIT at Berkeley. Um, and a lot of the focus there were on these sort of small-scale deployments where you put a few sensors in a building or a space. And one of the things we were thinking about, we started thinking about, is how can you sort of sense a wide, how can you do deployments that really sense a wide area, like a whole city? Um, and so why would you want to do that? Well, there's lots of things you might want to do. Civil infrastructure monitoring, like measuring what roadways look like or what you know, pipe, water pipelines look like all throughout a city, um, so on and so forth. Um, road surface conditions is sort of a <laughs> related thing. Monitoring black ice, probably not generally a problem you guys have here. Um, you know, some of these visual mapping applications, the sorts of things that Microsoft and Google are, are deploying where they take pictures of roads everywhere. Um, or you know, monitoring traffic throughout a whole city. So one way you might think about doing this is some sort of a wide area static sensing deployment, like putting uh, inductive loop sensors in roadways in order to measure traffic everywhere. Of course, that's costly both to deploy and maintain, right? It takes a huge amount of effort to do that. So the observation is, and again, you know, Google, the sort of, you know, Google and Microsoft taking pictures of, of you know, s of streets is an instantiation of this. Y you don't need, a lot of applications don't need image, you know, uh, don't need data at some incredibly high temporal fidelity. So for example, measuring traffic, you might be okay with knowing once per hour what every road looks like, or once every 15 minutes what every road looks like. You don't need continuous sensing all the time. Um, so that's sort of our, our insight, or what we're doing in this project is looking at the use of mobile devices for sensing. Um, in particular, um, we, we sort of, one challenge with mobile sensing is that, well, one way you might do this is to go, you know, for example, buy 100 cars, right, and put them out on the roads and have them drive all around all the time. But that itself is going to be pretty costly. So the sort of particular thing we're going at in the cartel project is what we call opportunistic mobility. And that's sort of the slogan on the front slide, you know, making sense of your drive to the store, right? Can we use the mobility that people have in their everyday lives already in order to sense things about the world in, in some way. Okay, so that's what Cartel is about. And there's um, two sort of obvious ways you might do this. One is by using cell phones and the other one is by using cars because these are things that people naturally have that they move around with all the time. Um, in this project, we really have focused more on cars, partly just because cars are this very attractive platform for deploying stuff right there. You know, it doesn't rain inside of cars. It, uh, they already they have power. You have power inside of cars. Um, there's this onboard sensor network inside of cars that lets you measure all kinds of things about what the car is doing and what it's experiencing. Okay? Um, so the sort of first question that I want to lead off with is just talking a little bit about what's the system architecture. Like, what's the thing that we built that allows us to get data from cars that are moving around? And then I'll talk, probably more of the talk will actually be about what we've actually done with this platform. So as I said, we've built this thing, we've had it running for about three years on a number of cars and have used it to do some things that I think are kind of neat. So I'll just tell you about that. Any questions about anything at this point? No? Okay. Um, all right, so Cartel is a mobile sensor computing system. Basically, think of it as a tool to answer questions about spatially diverse data sets, if you like, that are collected from these mobile devices. So suppose, you know, this is, it both has, you know, focuses on the collection of the data, so collecting traffic flow information from roads, as well as then, you know, allowing you to do some processing and uh, sort of asking questions about the data that you have collected. Um, and so with that sort of goal in mind, you can, at a very high level, decompose Cartel into sort of three core tasks. Some, you know, piece of software that does the collection and the processing of data, something that does the delivery of data, that is how do you get the data off of these mobile devices into some centralized infrastructure where you can look at it, and then some visualization or analyzing um, tools to allow you to sort of process the data. Okay, so, um, and just to sort of give you specifically how these three layers are instantiated in the Cartel project. Um, at the lower, lowest layer, um, 
we've the, the stuff that's actually running on the cars, there's a collection of embedded hardware. And this just gives you a picture of some of the earlier generation devices that we've been deploying. Um, this is just a little em embedded, basically, access point device from Socorus. Uh, it just has a Wi-Fi radio and uh, some flash storage or so on and so forth. Uh, GPS, interface to the onboard diagnostics network inside of the cars, in some cases, webcams. Um, we have a second generation deployment that we're doing that's based on a, a much smaller and cheaper access point device. It has no GPS, uh, does all of its localization via, um, via Wi-Fi. So it does, uses Wi-Fi both for localization as well as for uh, data uplink. Um, and we also have a, another box that we de we've deployed in some of the cabs that uh, in a, a cab test bed that we've been running that I'll tell you about in a little bit. Okay, so this is um, sort of running on the cars on the roads. Um, data is being transferred up over the internet. Um, in the cartel project, we've tried to be sort of agnostic about what the actual data, what in, insisting on one particular way of getting data off the cars. So, in particular, we don't want to, we didn't want to insist that every car that's out there on the road have a, a cellular data plan available to it to get data off, which would be then sort of is the sort of obvious way to get data off of things that are moving around on roads. One of the things we spent quite a bit of time doing, actually, and I'll talk about this, is investigating the question as to whether the currently deployed Wi-Fi networks in the world are sufficient for, you know, as a sort of data uplink for a lot of these mobile applications. I'll talk about how we've, uh, some of the technology that we've developed to make it so that cars can rapidly associate with wireless networks as they drive around. Um, and then the third piece of this is some sort of stuff that runs on the, on the web that users interact with. All right, so we call these the portal, um, the sort of at the middle layer, we have this thing we call Cabernet, um, so cab, net, cab network, um, which is a carry and forward networking system. If you look at our papers, there is something we used to call uh, CAFNet. Um, this Cabernet is sort of the second generation of this networking layer. And then there's IceDB, which is intermittently connect connected and embedded database, which is really the data collection uh, abstraction that runs down on the car. So I'll talk about these three pieces of the system um, quickly. All right, so just to sort of give you, the, give you a little bit more roadmap, talk about the three pieces of the system. I'll talk about deployments and the case studies that we've done. And then I'll talk a little bit, if I have time, about sort of how some of the things we've done to help users actually manage the data from a sort of, uh, that, so sort of the management of data that uh, has been collected from, the, from these things. So part of my um, end sort of research agenda with this is to build, I, I'm coming from the sort of database community and one of my agendas is to build tools that make it easier for people actually to manage all this data that's coming from things like cars out on the road. So I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. All right, um, so the portal, it, it really is a pretty, I would say this is a pretty generic architecture. There's some web server, there's some collection of applications that run inside of the web server that do things, uh, that provide these applications to users like a traffic application or a Wi-Fi application that allows users to visualize Wi-Fi. Um, these applications uh, can retrieve data from um, this thing that we call the IceDB server. It, this is really just basically a database um, except that it has the, it allows applications if they want to, to pose not only query historical data, but to pose queries that request that cars on the road deliver data continuously. So the traffic application, for example, can register itself with the IceDB server and say, deliver me GPS information once every uh, three seconds, okay? Um, and then there's some collection of data visualization tools that we've provided that allow users to, applications to sort of overlay data on maps and other things like that. Okay. Um, and then the way that communication works is this ICDB server uses the Cabernet system to receive data from cars as well as to uh, send, send data to cars that are out there on the road. And the real thing that Cabernet is doing for us here is dealing with disconnectivity, right? We're not making an assumption that the cars are always connected, and so therefore you need to sort of have some way to allow cars to pop up and register themselves and uh, you know, get data from and, and to buffer data on cars so that when they connect, they can deliver it to you, so on and so forth. Okay. Um, and of course, inside of this system, there's also a relational data. Inside of IceDB, there's also just a relational database that stores all the historical data. And most of the applications that we build actually are just querying historical data most of the time. The continuous queries are used to sort of configure things and set up the data that streams in. But for the most part, applications don't really want to change the data that's being collected in real time, at least in the, application, the deployments we've done. So I'll just give you a quick little demo of uh, sort of uh, the, this portal software. Um, I'm gonna, this is some sort of old data that we collected, but I, this is data from Hari Balakrishnan, so we're gonna compromise Hari's privacy all day today, so he's generously allowed um, me to do this in this talk. Uh, I didn't have a car for much of the time that we were doing this, so. 
Um, I'm not going to, I would love to talk to you guys about privacy, actually. I mean, I think it's a real concern here. I'm not going to go into much detail about it. I mean, the standard story that I tell people is, well, you know, Hari logs into the system and this is what he sees. So if all we're doing is just showing Hari his data, I'm not sure that the privacy question is huge. When it starts to get really problematic is when you talk about, which we'll talk about later, you want to take Hari's data and synthesize it together with everybody else's data to do interesting things. How do we make sure that we're not, um, compromising Hari's privacy when we do that. Like if I give traffic information about roads that Hari drives on, you can probably learn quite a bit about what Hari does. If I know there's, if there's only a small number of cars inside of the system and I know that Hari lives up here in Winchester, I can figure out things like when does Hari leave his house every day from that data, right? So that's definitely a problem. Um, okay, so we've got, uh, this is just a, a very simple visualization. It allows you to do things like, it's just running on top of Google Maps. It allows you basically these two blue boxes to find regions that we want to find roads um, within. So I said I want roads that go from here to here, uh, uh, drives, drives that go from here to here, and this is just showing me all those drives. Um, I can you know, click on one of these and see where that drive specifically goes. Um, there's some sort of interesting things you can observe about this. So this is the duration. You see that most of the time this is a 20 minute commute. Um, some days, like here, it turns out to be it's a 40, com 40 minute commute. So. so you have some definition of uh, trip segments which has a start and end points. As well as you say, you go somewhere, you stop for five, five minutes or one minute, and then you don't so this. In the case of an individual user driving around, this turns out to be pretty straightforward. You just Every time the user turns the car on and off, you use that to delimitate, oh, so delimitate roads, right? We do record that information. It gets a lot harder. We've been doing this now lately with cell phones. And we also have this taxi cab deployment. And those, both of those have this issue that cab drivers will, for example, sit somewhere with their, it's extra bad for our cabs because the cabs are all Toyota Priuses. And so the cab drivers will just sit there and they won't actually turn the engine off. They'll just sit someplace for a long time. And there's this sort of, you know, how do you decide, is this a new drive or is this just the cab driver sitting somewhere for a long time? So figuring out how you sort of delimit drives is hard. Cell phones have the same problem because the phone doesn't turn off. So you end up doing things like, well, we could use the accelerometer to determine that the user's been stationary for a long time and then we'll sort of segment drives manually or in, in some sort of heuristic way, right? I mean, it, fundamentally, this is like, or you could give the user a button that says I started or stopped doing something new, but it's hard to figure out how to actually split these up. For now, these are just split up from car turning on and off. Um, you can, so the sort of thing you would want to do is zoom in on this and see a little bit more information. So this is now the same drive. And Microsoft has really good network connectivity, by the way. It's just like, this thing is really snappy here to MIT. <laughs> um, you can zoom in on this and see a little bit of detailed information about the drive. So you see here, you know, so you see he, he leaves MIT and he goes on this uh, sort of um, Broadway up here. And you just see that he just, he just it took, this is one of these drives where it took him 43 minutes. And you just see he gets stuck at these lights, basically. He just, you know, backs up and waits for a long time to get through an intersection. So, and then this is a plot over here of his speed um, versus time. So one of the sort of cute things about this, Hari had sort of convinced himself that this back route was like the best way to drive from his home to work. And we actually have a little analysis that we did where we made him drive on the freeway like 20 days and we made him drive on this road like 20 days. And basically it turns out that the freeway is just, it's always a better option. Like these, even though you feel like the freeway is just awful, it turns out that on average it's like 10, you know, at five in the afternoon, it's like 10 minutes faster to take the freeway than it is to take back roads. Even though, you know, it takes you, you wait for five minutes to get on the freeway, but then when you finally do get on it, you actually move pretty quickly. Whereas here, you know, you're sort of moving, but you're just moving very slowly for a long time. But, but now so. you have another metric about how much gas it consumes and... Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, that, so I actually, I'll show you, I'll show you um, on the, we have a little traffic portal. One of the things we're doing that this is using new traffic planning. We actually have a little thing that'll say, here's how much fuel we think that it will consume and how much carbon dioxide we think you'll emit when you, you know, depending on this route. So. Um, so the other thing I said you want to do is this is supposed to be designed to be a kind of a generic visualization interface so we can do things like overlay engine RPMs. So this will color code his trace by engine RPMs instead of color coding it by speed. Um, we can also see all the Wi-Fi networks that he observed along this drive. So again, I, as I mentioned, one of the things we're interested in is investigating the use of wireless um, from moving cars. So this is just a log of all the wireless that he could see. In this case, red means uh, we saw it, but we didn't associate with it. Yellow means we were able to associate with it. Uh, and then 
we in this drive had the feature that actually caused the car to try and transfer data over the networks turned off. But in some of these, you'll see that the the lights, the things will be green, which means we actually sent data back from it. Yeah. I'm just curious, how did you get the RPMs? Have you actually tapped into the car's network? The, so the car has this onboard diagnostics network. So every car sold in the United States since 1996 um, has basically been required to have an onboard diagnostics interface. And this is primarily for emissions testing. So most of the data that comes over it is things like uh, the status of the you know oxygen sensor or something but every manufacturer has its own set of basically bits of information that it exposes over this thing so it just um, the almost if you look on your car typically it's under the drivers sort of under the where the driver's side the steering wheel section there's a plug there it looks kind of like a like a parallel port it's like a sort of a you know about that big and you just plug this so you can buy these solutions off the shelf um, Michelle knows quite a bit about it if you, you want to talk to him if you do the testing you know here in Washington State, they come plug you, plug your computer for uh, your car for a second. This is exactly the point. Yeah. Um, this is just an example from Seattle. So Michelle had one of these boxes for a while driving around. Um, he, in this case, put a camera on it, and you can actually see if we can get Google Maps to. Google does a very poor job of rendering imagery, but you can see what he was seeing out the front of his car as he was driving around. So. Um, so that's the visualization interface. Um, so the sort of next two pieces I want to talk about now are the, actually how we do the data collection and then uh, how we do the networking. So IceDB is this intermittently connected embedded database. Um, our idea or our thought was, well, the relational model is a sort of a convenient way to express what data you would like to collect from these cars. And I'll give you a couple examples of that. Um, so the idea is users write queries in an extended, simple version of SQL. Um, this is a continuous query processor, which means these queries specify not what you want to do to store data in the database, but what data you would like to collect. Um, and it's distributed, in, it's distributed in a really very simplistic way. just means users write queries at the server. Queries get sent to all the cars, and then all the cars send their data back at wh whatever data back that they, they want. So it's not, we're not somehow partitioning the query up into a bunch of different little pieces where different pieces are running on each car. Um, so the, one of the challenges we wanted to deal with in the ICDB world is the fact that bandwidth is variable. So you've got this data that's streaming back continuously, but the connectivity that the car experiences varies over time because you go into tunnels or you're in a region where there's not much wireless connectivity or your cell phone drops out. So you can't assume that you have this sort of regular, uh, a, a very continuous connectivity that you can sort of use to deliver data at, at regular rates. And so that means, first of all, you need to buffer the sort of query commands. If I issue a query, I may not be able to actually get that query to a car for several seconds. I also need to buffer query results. So a car collects information over time. It doesn't necessarily have the connectivity to deliver that information right away. Um, it also, one of the things we wanted to support was the car could store data locally that then users could come back and drill down into and query rather than necessarily sending all of the raw data off at a high rate from the cars. And then finally, and the thing that we really focused on in the ISDB paper and evaluation is we wanted some way to be able to prioritize results between uh, that, that cars collect. So the idea was every piece of data that a car collects isn't created equally. And so we, within the query language, provide support for users attaching simple uh, sort of user-defined priorities to the data items that the system takes into account when it's deciding what to transfer at a given point in time. And I'll talk in more detail about that. Just to give you a high-level picture of how this works, there's IceDB server, users issue queries to cars, car stream results back. Um, zooming in on what happens on the cars, there's some collection of sort of sensor hardware here. The sensors are talking through adapters. Think of these as like drivers that you know, let the car sample GPS, for example. Um, and then these, uh, the data is sort of going to be stored in these output buffers. Um, and the Cabernet system is going to be taking data from the output buffers and delivering it when connectivity becomes available. And then in the middle of this, there's sort of two data paths. One is the continuous query data path, where data just streams from the sensors into the buffers and then out through Cabernet. And the other piece is what we call this ad hoc query processing piece. So data comes from the sensors, gets stored in a local database on the cars, and then the user can issue queries externally over that stored data. Um, so we have these two data paths to co cope with limited data bandwidth. Again, the idea is locally, you can store more data locally than maybe you can transmit continuously off the car. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about the prioritization issue, which I think is sort of the, the, the most interesting one. So the motivation here is, again, um, there's a couple of different motivations. So the first one is what we call inter-query prioritization, which is within a query. Um, imagine I'm collecting some data, say, for example, about that car's, uh, a car's position with time, right? If you imagine you're in a bandwidth-constrained environment, so imagine at each one of these points you have 
not just position, but say a photograph or something, right? So if you, if you think about a bandwidth constrained environment, if you just take that data and you stick it into a FIFO buffer, right, the problem is that you're going to get a whole bunch of data about the very first part of the drive, but you're not going to get any information about what's happened during later parts of the drive if there's not enough bandwidth to transmit all of the information. So we wanted to provide a way for users to specify simple policies about what data is more valuable than other data within a query. Um, and so you can specify these things like this. So the, you, we, we basically added at the end of every SQL, SQL query is a thing that says something like delivery order by uh, first in, first out, right? So FIFO is like that would be the default ordering that all these things would get. But something you might rather do is what we call bisect here, which is you take, you, you know, take all the data that's in a buffer, in the buffer at a given point in time, you send the first point and the last point, and then for each of those segments, you recursively bisect them. Um, so you can specify delivery order bisect here. It turns out that there's no way to get the standard SQL order by clause to actually do this in, in the right way because um, what, this, what you want to do here is to reprioritize all the data every time a new data entry comes in, right? And the SQL order by clause just orders the data by some static value of every record. So um, now our idea here is that this bisect is not, we will provide a library of these kinds of prioritization functions, but this bisect is really the user is free to write their own simple prioritization function that takes the records in a, buff, in, a, in a buffer and reorders them however they would like. So we provide bisect as a default as well as some other things like random sampling as a default or uh, most recent value as, a, as, as things that you can use if you want, but you can also specify your own values. So this inter-query prioritization, this is great for... Um, it, it lets us deal with this case where within a particular piece of, within, within on a particular car, some data may be more valuable than others. But just within a single car, you may not have sufficient information to know how valuable your data is, right? Because um, my data is only, it, the, the data that I collect on a car is maybe um, less valuable if other cars have already collected it, right? So for example, if there's lots of cars that drive on the freeway every day, right? Um, it's not necessarily valuable for every one of those cars. You want some information about the freeway, but it's not necessarily valuable for every car to transmit information about the freeway. So the idea in the global prioritization scheme is, is again, is very simple. Um, this is just a, a, a sort of schematic of how it works. But the idea is that what cars can do is they, rather than transmitting all of their raw data as soon as they get connectivity, the user can specify a, a, way to, a, a summarization function that summarizes the raw data that the, the user has, that the car has. And then on the server, you can take all these summaries to, e the, the server takes this summary of the data the car has and uh, basically orders it and tells the car in what order the summarized value should, the, 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 the data should be transmitted back. So the server can take into account the sort of global information that it has from all of the cars. So I'll just give you a simple example. Um, imagine the cars have a bunch of imagery about um, the world that they've been driving around in. Um, and so what the cars can do is they can summarize this data in a very coarse granularity way by saying, um, by gridding the whole world up into a bunch of grid cells and saying these are the grid cells that I have information about. Okay, um, so this is, it's a very small amount of data. The cars just say, you know, here are the, the coordinates of the grids that I have information about. They send that to the server. So the way that they can, uh, one way they might specify this is, or the way that we let users specify this is by attaching the summarize as clause to um, every query or to optionally attaching a summarize as clause to queries. And what happens here is this is just a SQL query that specifies taking all the raw data, gridding it, um, and uh, just so you, you get to attach an arbitrary SQL query that sort of summarizes the data however you would like using SQL aggregates. Um, now what happens on the server is the server receives all of these um, receives all of these, this information from all the cars and it looks at this information and assigns priorities to it. And priority in the case of the server, the way it assigns priorities is the user just writes a function, an arbitrary function that can look at, that, at these priorities as they come in and it just assigns a numeric score to each one of the values in, in the, to each one of the entries in the summary. So for these, uh, for these uh, squares, do you actually have a temporary information? In other words, that the, the data that's more recent is more useful than the data that's, say, three hours ago. So again, this is, it's application specific. So the user can, if you want, you can include temporal information in this query, in this, in this summarize as clause, and it will be there. And then what the server gets is whatever it wants. The server can, then the server can write whatever function it wants to assign priority. So it can say, oh, well, this is a new bit of information about this grid cell that I haven't seen before, so it can assign a higher priority to that. So the server, again, the user writes an arbitrary prioritization function that can assign a score to each one of these grid cells. And then it sends it back to the, ser the servers and then the, the, the cars, and then the cars automatically join these 
uh, prioritized, the, 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 uses these priorities in order to compute the ordering which data should send back, be sent back. And the, the database system takes care of figuring out, uh, of sort of doing the reordering for you based on whatever priority you send back. So again, our sort of theme with ICDB was we want to allow applications to have control over the value of information. We think applications know that better than the, you know, the network or that the data, but we don't think the database can make good job, do a good job of doing this automatically, but we wanted to provide some mechanism that made it easy to do this. Okay, so um, and again, we provide these. We provide three uh, prioritization clauses that allow you to do this. I talked about two of these: the delivery order by clause and the summarize as clause. Priority is just a way to say broadly, you know, one one class of query is more important than another query. So GPS data is more important than camera imagery, for example. And then we have the ICD 2006 paper that talks about this. Yep. Do you think this architecture would change if, like, every car on the road was embedded with such a sensor? I mean. Or would you still be driven by a server-driven prioritization? Uh, if every car, obviously, you, if every car is running, if every car on the road is, I mean, I, I think uh, we're sort of thinking that this is working in the model where you have not, you know, 10 million cars that are all being queried simultaneously. We we're thinking this is our sort of test bed of some small collection of cars that we want to individually collect data from. I think this makes sense if you're an organization, you have a fleet of cars or you want to get information from those cars that you want to use specifically for your applications. Um, if this is personal, you know, if this is your personal data goes to your personal server or something, then obviously you would probably architect it in some slightly different way. That, does that kind of answer your question? Um, yeah, I was wondering, I mean, like things like in-network aggregation or some things like that, all the cars are not talking to the server. They don't need to talk to the server because... Um, sure. Yeah. So uh, again, um, the ICDB system does uh, it doesn't. So so we don't support um, aggregation of data across cars. So I think there's uh, uh, again uh, that's this is a good question. And I should clarify that in the Cartel project thus far, we have not really focused on the problem of car to car anything. Right. So we've been focusing mostly on car to infrastructure as the the main problem we've been focusing on. And the reason we've done that is because. From the outset, we wanted to sort of be able to build some, we wanted to be able to deploy stuff that we could uh, actually, um, we wanted to be able to, to do research that we could actually deploy in the real world. If you imagine 10,000 cars, you know, if you, it's, it's, it's great, it's fun to imagine what would happen if you had, a, you know, 10,000 cars on the road, but because we can't actually deploy that, then, you know, we haven't, so we, 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 we haven't really looked at car-to-car -car stuff, although I think there's a lot of very interesting things that happen with car-to-car, -car, including in-network aggregation, as well as the sort of peer-to-peer -peer communication, a lot of the delay-tolerant networking kind of things that come up, and um, that's something we're sort of a direction we're considering heading. I'll talk a little bit more about how we're thinking about scaling up the deployments that we have when I get to that part of the talk. Just one other question. Yeah. Um, was this, was this something that was unique to this car network, or is this something that comes up with other kinds of sensor networks as well? I think it could potentially come up with any kind of, I mean, I think what's, what's, you want this prioritization in, in settings where bandwidth is variable. I mean, that's, that would be, so I think you could, you could argue for this kind of a thing in any kind of a setting like that. I, and I think that, you know, I'm not sure that SQL is the right language for all users, but I think some sort of a high level language that allows users to say what data they would like to collect uh, and you know, specify sort of very sort of simple configuration of the data collection system in a declarative way is is a genuinely useful idea. So, and in that sense, and it's and it's broader than just cars. I mean, I don't we don't intend it for just being cars. So, since, since your, uh, not every car has an instant uh, connectivity for the data they have, and your model about what information that each car has is going to be. Know, out of date a little bit, right? And uh, you have some uncertainty in terms of where they have access to. So do you take that uncertainty into consideration when you optimize the uh, queries across multiple uh, users so, in a global sense? Um, again, uh, we've sort of evaded, I mean, I think that's a very interesting thing to think about. We sort of evaded it in the uh, what I presented here, right? Because I just said, well, the server has this run some arbitrary function that does whatever prioritization it wants. I mean, obviously, you could embed some, uh, so you sort of think of this as what we provide is the infrastructure upon which you could build something that could take that kind of uncertainty into account. Um, in the evaluations that we did of the system, we didn't spend a lot of time focusing on uncertainty, uh, it, specifically within the re regard to the ICDB system. Some of our other work where we've looked at modeling sensor data has looked a little bit more at uncertainty explicitly, and I, I'm not going to really talk about that in the talk, but maybe at lunch or something we can talk about it. Um, okay. 
So uh, now what I'm going to do is move on and talk a little bit about the Cabernet system. So again, the Cabernet system is what's the, this, the part of the system that's responsible for the delivery of the data from the cars up into the server. Okay? Um, and so what's going on here, we've got cars driving around on roads, they drive by Wi-Fi access points, they attempt to associate with them, deliver data off of them. That's primarily what the Cabernet system is working on, although it also supports you can plug in a cell phone into this thing and all these technologies will work. Although I'm going to spend a fair amount of time here talking about issues that specifically arise in the context of trying to do this with 802.11 with Wi-Fi. Okay? Um, so although the system supports both, both cell phones and 802.11, we haven't done anything particularly clever for the case of, um, uh, of cell phones. Okay, so um, again, the, what Cabernet, the sort of basic idea with Cabernet is it's a dis disconnection tolerant transport layer. So the idea is data gets buffered on the cars until connectivity becomes available, at which point it gets sent to whatever its destination is. So this means, fundamentally, this isn't a connection-oriented protocol. It's message, you're sending messages, right? You say, I have this message that I want to deliver to this application on the other end. Please enqueue it and deliver it when it arrives. Um, and there are two pieces of this system that I really want to talk to you about. The first one is this thing called quick Wi-Fi, which is thinking about how do you, you know, how do you establish connections very quickly from moving vehicles. And then the other piece is this thing I call CTP, and I won't talk very much about CTP, but uh, I'll just give you a quick sort of hint, talk about it very briefly, which is um, a well-known, obviously a well-known problem within wireless networks is that um, it, if you are in, in, in it, the, a problem with TCP is that it equates all losses with congestion, right? And that's obviously not a very, that's not true in the wireless environment where um, there may be losses due to the wireless environment. And so the, the wrong thing to do in the case, it, TCP does sort of the wrong thing in this case. It backs off, it sends at a slower rate when it observes losses on the wireless network. Whereas in fact, in our world, you might want to send at a slightly higher rate because these connections are very transient and you want to take advantage of whatever connectivity is there. Um, those of you who know Hari Balakrishnan, this is like his, you know, it, it, this was his PhD thesis and this is sort of his, a piece of this system that he's um, really worked on more than I have, but I just want to mention it quickly. So, um, all right, this is work with uh, postdoc Jacob Erickson. So, uh, again, the first challenge I want to mention is connection establishment here is very slow. So, uh, the, this is the issue again that if you just use Wi-Fi, if you just take, in, our, in this case our cars are running Linux, you just take the default Linux wireless stack, um, and you sort of say, okay, you know, just try and associate with whatever wireless access, access points you see. It turns out that this just takes forever. So uh, our measurements showed that in our initial deployments, it took on average about 13 seconds to establish an end-to-end -end connection. And you might say, man, 13 seconds, that's really bad. Why is that? Well, first of all, um, What's go there's just a lot of stuff that goes on when you have to get a connection, right? So first you have to scan, and then you, ha you have to scan for a network. Then you find a network, and you have to authenticate with that network. You have to associate with that network. You have to request the DHCP address. Um, you have to dis discover the DHCP server. Then you have to request the DHCP address, and then you have to do an ARP to announce your presence to the rest of the network, okay? And the problem, there's a bunch of problems with this. Um, First of all, there's a lot of messages and a lot of round trips, um, and they're sequentialized by default in the stack. So you do one phase, then the next phase, the next phase. Um, second of all, the loss rates here turn out to be very high. Okay? So if you look at this is a plot of loss rate through the lifetime of a connection. And what you see is at the beginning, so this is the percentage, the, the sort of overall connections. Um, it, this is 20% of the time into the connection, 40% of the time into the connection, and so on and so forth. So you see, especially at the beginnings of the connections, the loss rates are very high. And at the ends of the connections, the loss rates go up. And this is just because you're driving into range of the access point and then driving out of range of the access point. The problem is this little spike at the beginning of the, of the connectivity, right? Because what that means is when you first discover this access point, that's when you start doing this initiation protocol, just as you're driving into range of it. You have a very high probability of loss in any one of these phases. And you see that by default, the Linux stack uses these three-second timeouts. Right? And why they use three-second timeouts, I don't really know. But three-second timeouts just kill you because you get this, you know, there's a very high probability, like a 70% probability that your request to uh, authenticate or associate is going to be lost. And then you're going to wait three seconds before you even retry again. Right? And so that just introduces this huge latency into the stack. Okay? So um, as I said, the default Linux stack takes 13 seconds to associate. To give you a little bit of perspective, the average whole entire connection on average only lasts 19 seconds. Okay? So 13 seconds is really squandering bandwidth in this case. So um, what did we do? Uh, well, some of what we did was, is probably obvious. We turned down timeouts. That makes a difference. Another thing we did was to um, 
scan the more, most popular channels first. Okay, so it turns out that the, in, by default, almost all wireless access points are on either channel 1, 6, or 11, um, because these are the channels that are sort of maximally spread out in the uh, other, the, the intermediate channels actually overlap. And so even though by default the Linux stack scans, scans channel one, channel two, channel three, channel four, channel five, obviously it makes a, is a, it's better to scan channels in the, in the sort of with the, in the frequency with which they occur. So we have a little, we observe the frequency with which access points observe on channels over time and then we adjust our scanning policy to take that into account. Um, we also have, uh, you can also, because we're only trying to associate with open wireless access points, we're not connecting to authenticated networks. We just, you can, it, the, the protocol standard requires that you actually do authentication, the authentication phase, but you know if this is a wireless network, this phase is going to succeed. So you can actually do it in parallel with the, the next phase. The, the, there's no requirement that you wait until authentication has happened until you move on to the next phase. And because the authentication phase is basically a no-op in, in an open network, you can just go ahead and start request doing the other phases in the case when the network is open. We set all the timeouts to 100 milliseconds. Um, we play a bunch of other games where we can do some of these parallelization things for various phases of this thing. And the bottom line is we have this quick Wi-Fi stack that can associate with a wireless network in 370 milliseconds um, by default. And this is just a plot showing the time that each of the different phases takes. Um, all right, so the other problem that I mentioned that we deal with in uh, Cabernet is this problem of TCP treating wireless losses like congestion. Um, so this problem is similar, I mean, as I, as I said, this was Hari's PhD thesis. Um, you might wonder what's different in this particular setting. The real problem here is that um, we, uh, we can't control what software is running on the access points. Okay, so we get to control what's running on the two endpoints, but we don't know what's running on the access point. So if you think about what, in, what, you, what you would like to do here is to measure the loss rates um, that are due to wireless losses and the loss rates that are due to congestion, and then you'd like to factor out the losses that are due to the wireless channel because you don't want to take those into, you don't want to do congestion back off as a result of those losses. So the question is how do you understand what the loss rates look like on the wireless side, right? So if I'm sending from the car to the access point, this problem is easy because I can modify the software that's running the access point so I can basically modify the Wi-Fi driver so it tells me how many times it had to retry every transmission or something and I understand something about what loss rates look like. The problem is that if I'm sending from the server to the car, I don't have necessarily have access to that information. I don't have access to that information about how many of my losses were due to the uh, wireless, the wireless link. So what I can do instead is to try and estimate the losses between the car and the access point, the wired side losses, right, and subtract those out from the overall loss rate, and then I'll get some information about what the wireless losses were. Okay, so how do I do this? Well. Um, it turns out that this, so this is the problem of measuring from the internet to the car. So uh, the, it's just one of these sort of networking tricks that if you think about it long enough, it's, it's kind of obvious. You can understand, that you, most of the time you know the IP address of the access point, right? Because the, the access point is acting like a, uh, it's, it, it, it's um, serving as a NAT that's sitting in front of the car, right? So I know what the IP address of the access point is. So what we do is, and this works in about 90% of the cases, you send periodic probe packets to the access point, you address them to a random IP address, okay? And most access points, what they do in response to a, an, a packet sent to a random IP address, they send you a TCP reset back. And that gives you a way to estimate uh, the loss rates along that wired side of the link. And then you, have the, you can subtract out the wireless, okay? So um, the bottom line is that in, a, in the, this sort of this thing gets us something like uh, a 30 to 40 percent improvement by by doing this estimation. This way, we get something like a 30, 40, 30 to 40 percent improvement in overall throughput um, when we're running this protocol. In addition to the dramatic reduction in the overall connection, the overall connection duration that we get out of using quick Wi-Fi. Is this limitation to all open APs all the time, or does it measure when a car passes? Only when a car a car connect right a car. Basically, what happens is the car connects. The car says, oh, I'm here, I'm alive, I have some data to send, or I would like to download this file, and then we do the, run the protocol. Uh, okay. So now I've given you an overview of the software. Okay. So now what I want to do is sort of switch to telling you a little bit about what we've done with the system. Um, so <coughs> the, the deployment that we've done to date is, uh, as I actually should add a third deployment now to this. Um, we did initial deployment on about nine individual users' cars, um, and then we 
did a, have a partnership with a taxi company to deploy 27. Uh, we have this software running on 27 taxi cabs. And then since we've developed a next generation hardware box that we're deploying again on some individual users' cars with the goal of rolling this out to a much larger fleet of taxis, we have a partnership with Boston Cab um, that we hope will amount to a couple hundred devices that are out um, shortly. The taxi cab deployments actually is kind of an interesting story. I mean, when, anytime you're doing these kinds of deployments, you sort of, the question is like, what's in it for the taxi company? Why are these guys willing to allow us to put random hardware on their cars? So what we've done is, um, is kind, of a, kind of a good solution. Jacob came up with this. He's got these, he actually puts two computers in every cab. One of, these cab, one of these computers is hosting services that are beneficial to the cab company. So in particular, we provide the cab company with a little portal interface where they can go and see where all their cabs are. Um, we also provide a gateway that runs, the, the cab company was willing in this case to pay for EVDO modems for all the cars. So actually in the cab case, we have both Wi-Fi as well as EVDO modems. Um, and the cab company is, uh, one of the things they advertise now to their customers is a gateway that goes from Wi-Fi to EBDO. So customers can get in their cabs, open their laptops, and surf the web. So that's what the cab company got out of it. And then we have this second computer that's running there that's just running our own services. Um, so we have a separate Wi-Fi radio on this thing. And this, this second computer is actually loads its disk, it's the image, its boot image from the master box over Ethernet. Um, so we can actually upload over EVDO a new disk image that the secondary computer can then boot from. Um, and we have a way to... Uh, a little hardware relay so we can actually power toggle the secondary box from the master box as well. So that gives us a way to deploy new software out in the field that doesn't interfere with what's going on in the cars. Um, this is just a map showing in, I think, a week's worth of data all the roads that we get coverage about. This is sort of the Boston metropolitan area, and then this is the center of Boston. Here's MIT and Cambridge here, here's Boston. Um, so you can see that we get lots of data about all of the, basically all the major roads in Boston. How many cars? This is 27 taxis. So, um, okay, so um, that's, the, that's the sort of where all this data is coming from. And I want to talk about a couple of the applications that we've built on top of this. So the first one is a, a route planning interface. Um, so the way that the route planning interface works, the, the idea is let's use this data from cars to estimate what traffic looks like. Okay? So we can observe how long it takes every car to drive on every road segment. Um, and then we can build up a distribution. We, we can basically, for every road segment, build up a distribution of the travel times over that road segment. We're making this very simple assumption that travel times are Gaussian distributed, so we just compute a mean and a variance for travel times on every road segment. We assume that consecutive segments here are independent, which is obviously not a valid assumption. It's something we're coming back to and looking at how non-independence affects things. But clearly, you know, you've got two road, a road segment here in, is defined by the underlying maps that we're using, but typically it's from one intersection to another intersection. And clearly, if you have two intersections that are next to each other, there's a light that's in between them. The, the delays on those two intersections are correlated in some, in some way. But we're assuming that there are no such correlations. I mean, then we're looking at uh, simple route planning metrics that run on top of this. So one of them is uh, distance. Obviously, you can do distance-based routing. Google doesn't do distance-based routing. They do some um, very simple, you know, they, the weights of each road is weighted by the sort of size of the road, basically. So this is, you know, they know this is a road you can drive 25 on, this is a road you can drive 35 on, so on and so forth. Um, but we can now do things like expected delay routing. So what's the, what's the route that's going to have the expected fastest travel time? And then we've looked at kind of an interesting variant, which turns out to, uh, which turns out to be a little bit, um, you can't just throw Dijkstra's algorithm or A-star or whatever at it. It's this sort of problem of finding the probability of missing, uh, uh, finding a, a route that has the maximum, prob a maximum probability route. So I can say I want to find the route that has the highest probability of getting me to my destination within 15 minutes. Okay, and I'll talk a little bit about why you can't just throw Dijkstra's at that. But, yep. If you look at time of day or day of week to... Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a little demo. Um, so this one, I think. So this is just a, the, the interface. I don't know if you can read it. I'm sorry, the fonts are so small. But um, this is, says you can say at this, at this time of day and this day of week, um, I would like to know um, what's the minimum distance route or the minimum expected time route or the route that has the highest probability of getting me there within this deadline. Okay. So this is the or O here is origin, D here is destination. Um, what this, this route that I'm asking for, for anybody who's lived in Boston, is the route from MIT um, out to the entrance to Route 2. So most, a lot of people who live in the sort of suburbs around Boston commute out from Route 2. You either, a lot, you know, people, 
you know, there's suburbs to the north, to the south, and then out Concord and Lexington are out to the west. And a lot of the faculty and people at MIT commute in from the west. And if you know Boston at all, you can sort of, you probably have an opinion about the best way to do this drive from Route 2 to here. Everybody, you know, sort of says, oh, you know, well, you should take Mem Drive, right? Or you should take some little, you know, complicated route through here or whatever it is, okay? So if you ask Google what it thinks you should do, Google actually will give you different, is very sensitive to the starting point of this route. But um, what Google says you should do is you should come up here and then you should get on this road here, which is Massachusetts Avenue, okay? So this is almost certainly not the right way to go, right? Um, because this Massachusetts Avenue connects, is the road that connects Harvard to MIT together. And at 3 to 4 p.m., it's going to be packed with cars, okay? Um, so if you ask our system what it thinks you should do, you say, what's the minimum expected time route? This is the route that it thinks overall will take the, take the shortest time at this time of day. Um, what it finds is some, some route um, which avoids Mass Ave, basically. It goes and it takes a little side street and it takes this Prospect Street here and it takes another side street. And it does get on Massachusetts Avenue a little bit here, but this is after it's already passed Harvard. So it's a sort of a, it seems like it's a better part of Mass Ave. And then it again takes some little back road to get you out to where you need to go. And th this, what this visualization over here is showing is the uh, amount of time, um, this number can't be right, but uh, the amount of time that the, um, it takes to drive on each one of these segments. So each one of these lines is a road segment. And the, um, we have information about the number of samples that we have about these road segments as well. So we have anywhere from 800 samples at this time of day to you know, other segments where we have 10 or 15 samples about how fast cars could drive. Okay? Um, and so you see that it, this information here it also is computing things like the expected fuel consumption of the drive as well as the expected CO2. Um, there's a bug here where it's somehow not computing CO2, right? So there's some normalization factor the student who's doing this has wrong. But, um, and it tells you what the expected average velocity is as well as the probability of making this thing within uh, 15 minutes. So now I can also ask for the maximum probability route. It's going to turn out that when we have 15 minutes, the maximum probability route is the same as, I think, this is demos, not can, so the routes do change sometimes, but yes. The, uh, the, is the, the maximum probability route is the same as the uh, maximum expected time route. But if I have more time, if I say I have 19 minutes, then what we'll actually see is that the maximum probability route is slightly different than the minimum expected time route. So it says if you have 19 minutes, you should take this other road, this other way, which it thinks has a 99.7% 99 chance of getting you there. And the reason it picks this road um, is because even though this road has a higher expected travel time, it thinks it has a lower variance. Okay? Um, and so it's better to take a road. It says, okay, it's better to take a road with a lower variance with a, with a higher average expected travel time. Okay. So, um, so this maximum probability planning algorithm, as I said, turns out to be kind of interesting. Um, and the sort of the, the insight or the observation here is that, well, um, if the sort of, well, so the way to think about this problem is if you're trying to do maximum probability planning, the, tra the travel time of each edge is a Gaussian, and if travel times are of each segment is independent of every other segment, then the travel time of an entire path is also Gaussian distributed. Okay, and so our goal is to find the path with the maximum probability of reaching uh, a destination by some deadline. Um, you can't just throw Dijkstra's or dynamic programming at this because these, these problems don't have sub, there's not a suboptimality to this. And what do I mean by that? Well, is if I have three, if I'm trying to go um, from A to B, right, and there's some intermediate node C, um, just because this route from, th just because this route through, for example, uh, route one to C is the optimal way to get to A to C, that doesn't necessarily mean that this route one would be on the optimal path from A to B to C, okay? And dynamic programming sort of exploits, the, the sort of Di Dijkstra's algorithm exploits this fact in order to be able to have an efficient, do an efficient search, right? Um, so I just have some examples that show that basically you can end up with alternative, the alternative route being the uh, optimal, the, the, I'm going to skip through this visualization, but the optimal path can be the one that's not the, the optimal path from A to B via C can be, uh, may not contain the optimal route between A and C. Um, and so what we've done is we have a, so you can't use just A star or Dijkstra. Um, we have a student who's been working on this problem. He has a, um, a sort of heuristic, exponential time heuristic algorithm that works pretty well in practice. I mean, we have it running on real data. Um, and there have been some other people who study this problem as well. But. Um, okay, so that was traffic. Now I want to talk about potholes. Okay, so potholes, 
Um, what's, what's, what's going on here is we've, with these cabs, we went out and most, in a bunch of these cabs, we put accelerometers. Okay, so these are sampling at uh, 600 hertz, I believe. Um, so we've got these three axis accelerometers that are measuring, you know, both how the car is going this way as well as up and down on the roads. And then we just let the cars drive around wherever they go. And we're looking for potholes. So a pothole looks like a spike like this in the road. And we have some um, sort of relatively straightforward uh, sort of machine learning classifier that runs on this and tries to distinguish a pothole from a not pothole. So we went out and we drove over a bunch of potholes and that was our training data. And then we input that into our, into our system in order to find potholes. So. Um, we actually have a map that you can go to and you can see these are the 10 biggest potholes in Cambridge. You can click on one of them and you see a plot of the thing. We went out and took pictures of the potholes as well. Okay. Um, so what's actually going on here is uh, we, we have a simple classifier that can dis determine several different types of road, road anomalies. So we look not just at potholes, but actually trying to distinguish potholes from other kinds of bumps that you experience in roads, like manhole covers, as well as uh, railroad crossings or expansion joints and freeways that cross the freeway entirely. It turns out that we can do a pretty good job of differentiating between manhole covers and potholes and other sort of uh, protrusions in the road from things that cross the entire road. And the reason it, of that is we can see that um, if you imagine if you go something that goes across the entire road, it goes like this with both wheels, um, whereas a pothole does something like this. Okay, so you can see that in the accelerometer. Um, so the, we, we, and basically our classifier works by extracting a bunch of different features from the signal and then we run one, a, a sort of a standard classif classification algorithm on top of this thing. Uh, and then we, once we've found things that look like candidate potholes, we do some clustering in order to um, basically group together detections that were near each other, as well as to throw out detections that haven't been seen very many times. So we want to throw out things that haven't been seen very many times because one, they're anomalies like people slamming doors or you know, people knocking the accelerometer inside of the car. So we want to filter those things out that if we want things that only occur at the same place uh, um, multiple times. And also if there's something that only occurs once, it's probably not a pothole that we need to worry that much about, right? Because um, you know, drivers, if drivers can avoid the pothole most of the time, then it's probably less severe than something that gets hit all the time, okay? Um, so that's, again, we have a Mobisys 2008 paper that talks about this uh, particular deployment, talks about some of the data we've collected. Um, but that's, at this point, this is sort of all I'm going to say about the pothole thing. Okay, so um, the next and the last little part of the talk that I want to talk about in terms of what we've done with it is some experiments about Wi-Fi. So I mentioned that we've been trying to associate automatically with, um, that one of the things we're trying to do is look at Wi-Fi as an uplink for these devices. So I'm going to sort of talk about um, what we did to measure um, whether that was feasible or not. And I want to talk a little bit about some more recent work we've been doing on Wi-Fi based mapping or using Wi-Fi for doing mapping. All right, so um, the idea here is Everybody knows there's a lot of wireless out there, right? You go out anywhere in the city, you open your laptop, and you observe a huge number of access points. Um, so on a typical drive, about hour-long drive around Boston, we'll see something like 1,000 access points. Um, on average, about 5% of those access points are open, okay? So we're interested in the question as to whether there's enough connectivity from these open wireless access points to get data off of the cars. Uh, a common question is whether this is legal. Uh, it turns out that it, uh, at least in Massachusetts, it apparently is not illegal. Um, it's, uh, there are no laws that say you can't, you know, you can't just associate with these, with, with these access points. In some states, there, it appears to be less, is a little bit more dubious. Um, from our perspective, we're interested in it because if you could, you know, one of the, if you could demonstrate that these networks were a feasible way to get data off of cars, then you could imagine partnerships with hotspot providers, partnerships with urban municipal area networks, um, or even incentivizing people to open up their networks in order to um, allow you to access. So there's a lot of these companies like Phone and Meraki who have, are now doing these large scale deployments where they're basically getting people to, you know, participate in an open in an open network um, sort of built from the ground up. Okay, so um, again, there's another, there's another example. This is Wiggle.net. I don't know if you guys have seen Wiggle.net, but this is these people who do war driving, so they just build these maps of where all the open wireless access points are. Every city is just covered with wireless access. Here the green dots are open, the red dots are closed. Okay? Um, all right, so the question is, well, you know, given that there's all this connectivity out there, can we actually use Wi-Fi from cars as we're driving around? So the experimental method we used is really it's very straightforward. Cars are just sitting this sitting in a loop, scanning. Um, 
when they see an open access, wireless access point, they attempt to associate with it. When that's successful, they acquire an IP address using DHCP. Um, and then what they do is they begin an end-to-end -end ping with a server at MIT. And this is to demonstrate that this network is actually open because there's a lot of these for pay networks that from the point of view of the wireless stack appear to be open, but they actually require you to do HTTP authentication before they'll deliver, they'll deliver data for you, right? So you have to pay, you have to put your credit card in. So um, once we have established that the network is in fact open in this way, we do two things. We initiate a small TCP test upload to our server to measure the bandwidth of the connection. And then um, we begin a local AP ping. So we just start pinging, the, the car starts pinging the local access point. And this is again in order to determine the duration of the connection. So when we can no longer ping the access point, that must mean we're out of range of the access point. And then once we get three seconds of lost pings, we go back to scanning. Okay, so um, this data was collected. This was uh, done with our, an early deployment. So this was done with our individual, all the data I'm going to show you was done with just individual cars, not with the taxi test bed. This is from a Mobicom 2006 paper. Um, so it's about 32,000 access po distinct access points that we observed. 290 distinct kilometers of road and about 300 hours of driving, okay? So um, association duration is the first metric. So the first question you might have is, how long is a car associated with a, with a network on average, okay? When it gets connectivity. So this is, we're scanning, we associate, we get an IP address, we get a ping, we lose the connection. So we're interested in how long does this AP ping, the last, the time from the first AP ping to the last AP ping, okay? And that's the association duration. This is just a CDF of association duration. So um, I already told you that I think the mean is something around 19 seconds. You can see the median uh, is about uh, 13 seconds. So the mean is slightly longer than the median because this is a long tail distribution where there's some connections that last a really long time, like two or three minutes because the car's sitting in traffic or sitting at a stoplight or stopped. Okay, so the thing to get from this is that um, we get uh, quite a bit of connectivity, right? 15, 20 seconds is a little bit surprising. The other question, though, is what about um, how does this vary with the speed of the car, right? Like, is this only because are we only getting these connections when the car is stopped? So this is just the fraction of associations that we had versus the speed of the car. And you can see that we continue, we have pretty, you know, pretty linear distribution of associations by speed up to about 60 kilometers an hour, okay? So this is like, whatever, 35 miles an hour or something. Partly, our data mostly consists of people driving about 35, you know, not, not driving on the freeway. These are mostly people who live in and around MIT who take city streets. Um, but it also probably is the case that there's just, you're not going to do as well as you get on the freeways. There's fewer wireless networks and there's less opportunity to connect. Okay, so um, this is just showing a, uh, the distribution of connection duration by speed. The thing that don't, this right here, this, there just aren't very many connections that are happening here. But the thing to observe is obviously connection duration goes down as speed goes up. Not surprising, right? Um, okay, so the kind of takeaway here is we get connections at a lot of speeds. We don't have a lot of data at higher speeds, but you know, for at least city driving, there's quite a bit of opportunity here, right? And then when we get connections, they're pretty long, right? Like 15, 20 seconds. So there's ability to upload quite a bit of data when that happens. All right, so the next question though is, okay, well, that tells me how long connections last on average, but how frequently do you actually experience connections? So we looked at two metrics, which are we call disconnection duration metrics. And these are the delay between attempts to join. So how often do we just see any old access point, not successfully associate, but how frequently do we see an access point? And then how frequently do we successfully associate and uh, obtain end-to-end -end connectivity? So um, these are just this, this is just a CDF showing those, those two things. The dark black line is the number, the distribution of attempts. Okay, so again, if you look at the median here, you can see that we see an access point about every two seconds on average. Okay, um, of course this is very, uh, that this metric sort of makes that seem, it's not that you really see an access point. You, you, sometimes you'll see 20 access points in one second, and then you'll have t 20 seconds with no connectivity, right? So this thing is, it's a pretty variable measure, but at a coarse granularity, it gives you a sense of what, uh, what, what's going on here. And you can see that the, you know, the, so the median of associations is we get an association on average about every 13 seconds. Okay, so we get an association about every 13 seconds. It lasts 19 seconds uh, on, on average. Um, sorry, the, me the mean is different than 13 seconds. I, um, sorry, the, um, we get the median here is every, is, is, every, uh, is every about 13 seconds. The mean is much, much higher than that because um, we, uh, there are long periods where there's no connectivity at all, like when you're driving on the, on the street. Okay, so it actually turns out that we get a, uh, the mean disconnection time is about 260 seconds. So it's about four minutes. And every, about once every four minutes, we get um, this 19 seconds worth of connectivity. 
Okay? And about every 20, 23 seconds we get a, uh, we see an access point on, in, on average as opposed to a median. Uh, and then the final question is just, okay, how much da total data do you transfer when you get a connection? And this is just showing a CDF of that. Again, you can see that if you sort of go across this 50% line, you can see that there's about, this is, graph is really hard to read, I'm sorry, but it, this is about 200K, okay? So you get about 200K of data when you get an association. So you can, if you like, um, you get the mean is actually 600K, so the mean is considerably higher because the average, the connectivity is, is somewhat higher when you have, uh, you, because connection durations are longer when you have, um, you get more data through because con the mean connection time is longer than the median connection time. In average, you get more data through than in the median. Um, so the sort of takeaway from this is there's a lot of connectivity in the wild, right? We get on average 600 kilobytes every 200 seconds. Okay, so if you like, uh, you can think of this as like uh, whatever a, th a three a, a three kilobyte per second network, right? At some you know viewed at a very high level, and three kilobytes a second doesn't sound like a huge amount of data, but if you're thinking about getting traffic off of cars or traffic or traffic information onto cars or news updates like textual information onto cars, um, it's quite it, it's it's definitely sufficient information to it's sufficient bandwidth to get a fair amount of data onto or off the cars in real time that might potentially be very useful, you know, giving you your email in your car, right? All those kinds of applications could be supported by this kind of thing. So we think that's pretty encouraging. And this is true even at sort of normal driving speeds as users are driving around. Yeah? I'm sure this over time, whether this ratio of uh, open uh, access point is getting more and more or less. Yeah, so now that we, that's something that we're sort of is on our stack of things to do now. We've had this running for a couple of years to actually look and see whether there's any appreciable change to this over the last couple of years. Um, it seems probable that openness has gone, da gone down somewhat. Although, uh, I mean, we've been running these experiments. We, we've switched over. We have our, our next generation network is, we're looking at is really is Wi-Fi only, and it works surprisingly well. So, um, all right. So um, the last thing I just want to talk about with respect to Wi-Fi as a sensor um, is this uh, what we call VTRAC. Um, and again, this sort of, the, there are two things that are going on. The, the sort of one motivation of VTRAC is to look at whether it would be possible to build this kind of system that we had before in a framework that doesn't have any GPS. Okay, so um, why would you want to get rid of GPS? Well, it makes it a little bit more expensive. For us as academics, if we're trying to deploy a thousand of these things, that cost maybe matters. In some cases, it may not matter. Um, it also complicates deployment a little bit because you need an antenna that has a clear view of the sky. If you imagine a GPS you know, buried in your pocket all the time uh, in a cell phone, for example, you're likely to have significant loss and obstruction issues as a result of that. GPS also is quite power consumptive. Um, so our approach is to use Wi-Fi to do positioning. Again, using Wi-Fi to do positioning isn't an entirely new idea, right? People have been doing this for quite a while, and there now are these companies, Skyhook, uh, for example, Navazon that have these things that run like on your on phones that you can say, tell me where I am, and it uses Wi-Fi triangulation in order to estimate your position. The difference in VTRAC is that we're not estimating your position at a single point in time, but you're trying to estimate the trajectory that you took over time, particularly the historical trajectory that we took, you took. So we get an observation of all your wireless, all of your positions over time. And then we're trying to find a path that traverses a series of roads that explains that those positions, right? Um, and then we try and match those things to roads. So, um, and this is just a plot showing if you just were to do this with raw Wi-Fi, you see that the mean error is something like 73 meters of this sort of raw, you know, the kinds of, the, the estimate that you get from using a Navazon-like uh, or a, a Skyhook-like thing is, in our experiments, about 73 meters, okay? So that's not good enough to really know what road you're on. Um, so that's kind of the problem we've been trying to solve. And this is just a picture showing um, what happens. This is if you just take the, the, the you take every time you see an access point, or a, a, lo, a, a series of access points, you use this uh, Wi-Fi localization algorithm like um, what these companies provide in order to estimate where you are, and then you connect that together with a bunch of lines. Okay, so blue is where you actually traveled according to a GPS, and green is what you see. And this is fairly typical of what we see. This is actually good uh, based on our observations. You see these things where the car seems to be jumping from one location to the other because we don't exactly know where the centroid is. And you see these funky things where it seems like it you know, did this, went on this path that it just didn't go on. It's kind of ugly looking. Okay, so the problem we're trying to solve is, and I'm not going to go into too much detail about how we've solved this problem, but um, there are 
a lot of tricky issues that sort of come up with this thing. So one of these, so I already mentioned that the accuracy is just poor. The other problems that come up is we see people moving their access points around with time. So in Cambridge, you get students who move from one place to another. And so you see an access point that you thought was in one location that's actually in some other location. And that really, really screws up your algorithms. Um, you also see crazy roads, right? So there's these intersections where it's just how do you, I mean, it's very, very hard to figure out what road you're on. Um, like in freeway overpasses are typical. Um, and then you also see things like cab drivers who drive around and around in circles, which makes doing this, makes this problem just really, really hard. But um, we've looked at two approaches. Um, one of them is an iterative shortest paths approach where we take two, two endpoints of a route. We, we sort of find uh, locations that we're pretty sure about where we have lots of Wi-Fi observations that seem really good. We connect them with the shortest path and then we try and see if that shortest path explains all the other access point observations that we saw or explains enough of them. And if it does, then we say, okay, we're done. If it doesn't, then we recurse. We find some other intermediate points and we connect those together. And we do that until we get a route that seems to explain most of the observations we've seen. We've also looked at a particle filter based approach where we constrain the path of the particles to travel on roads and to travel at car speeds. Okay, so um, the very preliminary results we see is we get about 80% estimate of road segment accuracy. Whether that's enough or not, we're not sure. We, one thing we'd like to do is to be able to throw out the 20% of bad estimate. So if we could get 80% that we were sure about and 20% that were, we knew were bad, then we think this would actually be pretty good. That's what we're working on. Um, we also get mean error, position errors in the range of about 2 meters per second or 10 kilometers per hour. Speed errors, so we're estimating speed on road segments as well. I'll just give you one last little visualization. Um, this is just an example of a drive. Um, so you see here, um, we don't actually have raw GPS information. The two lines are red is the Wi-Fi, the, the centroids of the Wi-Fi localizations that we saw over time. And so you can see that it, in many places it doesn't match roads very well and it appears to do funky things like um, jump around. So this is a case of one of these access points that seems to have moved. Um, Anyway, so the system is able to match this particular drive onto a set of roads that it appears to be doing a pretty good thing. And this is just showing all the data that we've collected from this particular car over the last you know, few days. So this is current now, up to now. Because, uh, you don't have it, it doesn't have any information. There were no observations during from here basically until somewhere down here. And it just, the system said, oh, well, you know, it just used this Trapello Road, as, as, which is almost certainly the right road in this particular case. I mean, Trapello Road is the only major road that goes through this, this area, so. Um, okay, so I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna wrap up. I did wanna talk a little bit about managing missing and uncertain data and some of the database work we've been doing, but um, I just, I, I think you guys probably, I don't know whether, should I, should I keep going or you guys tell me? I mean, it, it's been an hour, so. Um, I'll, I, it'll take two minutes. I mean, I, it's not, okay, if you guys want to run, feel free to run. Um, so one of the problems we've been sort of looking at in this case, and this is that this function DB system is about is, okay, so we've got all this data. Um, how do we sort of allow users to make sensible queries over all this data? So one problem is that if you just run raw queries on discrete data, it turns out not to work very well. So here are the little red points are GPS, uh, the data coming from the GPS sensor over time. And this is real data that's stored in our system. And you see that, you know, there's just these periods where we don't have any position information because either some packets were lost or because the GPS, you know, went out on us for some period of time. We have missing data, right? Um, and so if the user asks a question like, what was my average speed in this rectangle? You know, who knows what kind of answer you're gonna get, or right? When did, did the car pass through? When, tell me all the cars that passed through this rectangle even, right? You're gonna get some sort of nonsense answer. So what you'd rather do, instead of querying the raw data, probably is fit some collection of line segments to this data, right? That tell you trajectories, basically, that estimate where the car was going and its speed over time. And so that's the idea in function DB, which is that rather than storing discrete data points, we're gonna allow the system to store trajectories. In particular, we're gonna provide support inside of this database system for automatically fitting functions to raw data as it streams in. So these fit functions get maintained over time by the system um, as data streams into the database. And then we allow queries to po users to pose queries over these fit functions. And it, so the users can always pose date queries over the raw data if they want, but they can also define what we call uh, model-based views that are fit views over the, the raw data that users can pose queries over when they prefer to be querying over this, this fit data. So we support these kinds of models as first-class objects inside the database and we allow users to query them. So just to give you a simple example, suppose I have a collection of raw data, like uh, temperature readings over time, okay? Um, and suppose I wanna know, tell me the time when the temperature crossed this threshold, right? Um, 
the simple way to write this in SQL would be to say select time where temp temperature equals threshold. Okay? Um, clearly, at some point, you know, you can, if you had interpolation, you could guess that the temperature probably was actually at that point in time. But if you ask this query of the SQL database, you're going to get a null response back. Okay? And this is a trivial example. So yeah, you could say where temperature is greater than threshold. But um, just to, it, the, the idea now in function DB is that we can fit a function. You say, fit this data using this regression function. And again, the user gets to specify what regression function they would like to use to fit the data. And then they can ask this question, select time where temperature equals thresh. And what the system will actually do when it evaluates this query is to solve this equation in order to figure out times when the equation crossed the, that time. So the kind of cute thing about this is that now query processing, instead of um, doing this uh, query processing, instead of looking at a whole bunch of discrete points and seeing whether they satisfy the condition in this query, query processing actually becomes doing a little bit of function solving. Okay? And the system, the sort of meat, the interesting part about the system so this, what we've built is a system that works for any polynomial function. It's fit with regression. Uh, it maintains these regression functions over time as data streams in. Um, we support aggregates and joins over the data. So aggregates become uh, integrals. So an integral, you know, find the average temperature over this range is an integral under the curve, right? Uh, it also supports joins of two data sets together. So you can sort of uh, attach new data to a particular uh, curve. So I could, you know, if I had um, light data in addition to temperature data, I could join those two data sets together and get a new join data set that represented light and, light and temperature over time. Um, and then the sort of cute, all the guts of the query processor that turns out to be interesting is how do you deal with the case where you have queries that you can't have find, easily find a closed form solution to. So the system actually falls back on a form of approximation that it uses to estimate the answers to queries. But we find that you get about five to six times performance gains versus running the queries on raw data um, when you're doing this inside of Cartel because there's just so much less data. These functions are so much more sparse than the actual raw data that the performance actually turns out to be better. And on top of that, you get this um, advantage of uh, you've, you're querying these fit functions, this cleaned up data, instead of querying this sort of raw, un, unclean data. So that's. Your experience, I mean, you know, your example of uh, temperature is actually a really nice example that you can actually fit the data even though the data yeah. is quite sparse. Um, how much of uh, in your experience is uh, application specific function fitting, and how much of the, it's quite general that you can actually apply to? Very large number of uh, different kinds of data sets. So, I mean, again, obviously, figuring out what, how, what, what the right way to fit your data is and what set of basis functions to use and all that stuff sure. is a very application specific thing, and it's something that everybody wants to do slightly differently. Our idea is, though, for a lot of science types, anyway, people are using pretty simple tools, right? They're doing interp they're happy with in simple interpolation or some fairly simple linear regression things. And we think you can support those in the database system pretty well. I mean, we don't say you must use, you know, we, we support any class of polynomial basis function in the system, which we, uh, you know, it's very hard for me to say, you know, is this general for all users in the world? Of course, maybe it's not. Um, but it does seem like it's useful for at least the kinds of data that we've worked with, like trajectory data. Is clearly what you want is some form of interpolation on trajectory data, right? And we can do these play these same tricks with interpolated data. And it also does seem for some of these simple, simple sensor field data, like temperature stuff, it seems to be fit pretty well by simple basis, sim relatively simple polynomial basis functions. Um, but is that if you can give the user, in addition to the answer, some estimates of the confidence. We, we absolutely can. When you do fitting, you can absolutely say, here's the quality, here's the quality of the regression that you ran. And so one idea, I mean, I, you know, one idea is to start to support to add more. I mean, if, if this idea, if, you know, as this, if this idea were to take off, one thing you could do is clearly add support for a broad range of models that would be supported inside of the database system, right? So, um, Anyway, so um, just to quickly wrap up, um, mobile sensor networks, I think, have a really great potential to sense the world at a much higher scale than these static networks that are much cheaper. In the car space, anyway, lots of applications, traffic, fleet management, automotive diagnostics, this kind of wireless network monitoring and mapping, um, environmental stuff, like imagine putting pollution sensors on cars, traffic planning, um, like where should I build roads? Um, I talked about the three sort of high-level components of the system, the portal, ISDB, and Cabernet, and then I went into some details about some of the applications and research results that we've come up with. So we have a website. Um, go check it out, and happy to take more questions. The stuff you demo can find that, that website too, or just um, Some of it can. If you, want, like, if you want a specific demo, we can you know, find a way to get you okay. a specific no, demo. We're Harry Lee, like that stuff. 
No, yeah, so we don't have, some of that data isn't there, but if you want, if you guys, if you like want to show somebody in your research group a demo, I'd be happy to, you know, get, Michelle knows how to get to all of it, and we can, we can show you web pages of it, so. So I do have a, a little question. You mentioned using Wi-Fi as a way to estimate the location based on the current location, current sensor data, but also the history. Yeah. Um, so, so you, know, you said explicitly that you're not going to actually talk about the privacy and other issues, but that, that does have an implication on the architecture design, right? And you actually keep the segments from uh, the past history, and someone has yeah. access to the database. So, have you know, clever ways of querying the system can tell, you know, Sam what you have done. You know, the sure, you have this access. You have this thing that says, oh well, Sam will saw all the visited all this car visited all these access points at this point in time, and, and clearly that you know, we have a database right now that has all that information in it. And you know, if you look at it, you can learn pretty interesting things. I mean, most people don't. First thing you learn is most people don't do anything interesting. Like they drive to and work every day and do exactly the same thing. But you can see a lot about what people have been doing. I agree My that question, is problematic. What's so what these implications for your future system design when you take those into consideration? Yeah. So I think um, you absolutely you, you need to be taking this stuff into consideration. And there are some things that you can do, like, for example, not reporting. You know, If a user didn't report his information when he was within some radius of his house or when he was on some road that he knew he was the only person who ever drove on or something like that, then that could potentially um, be a one way to mitigate privacy concerns. But I think that what needs to happen is some, I mean, as these systems get more and more popular, I view it as sort of being two things. One is there's a technological thing that happens where people come up with formal models that allow us to reason about what it means for data in this kind of spatial world to be private. And I, that's happening. People are working on doing it. We have some students who are working on doing it. The other thing that needs to happen is there needs to be a set of policies that get established here that, like, say, you know, in this setting, for example, you know, it needs to be illegal to, not illegal, or there needs to be some set of regulations that say what it's okay, to, what data is okay to, export in this way and what data is not okay. So I, that's kind of the way I view it, but question? Have you tried doing uh, AP viewing uh, correlation to try to notice when these APs move? Um, um, sorry, so what do you mean by AP viewing correlation? So, so that says... So say you're in one spot and you see access points A, B, and C, and then later, er, and at the same time, temporal time, somebody else might be in a different spot and see D and E. And then later someday, you know, DNA yeah. is way far away, right? And they see D, E, and B, you know. Sure. So they, we can do that. I mean, and it clearly happens. Is there, uh, the question is whether there's some, I mean, you can learn interesting things about how frequently things move around. I mean, I don't know if there's a more interesting application than that besides for people who are using Wi-Fi for localization well, like us and trying to fi filter those out. In terms of just keeping your database accurate. Yeah, filter. So clearly we can filter. We can filter. One thing we can do is to to we one a good time when you might throw out some old observations of an access point. I mean, there's always this question about how long should you keep these things around in your database. If you suddenly see that something appears to have moved location, um, you probably want to throw the old observations of that thing out of your your database, right? Uh, what's the density of the text in Cambridge or Boston? Uh, do you have any? I, mean, um, I, was, I was thinking if you you build a uh, net instead of using the Wi-Fi. Yeah, so I'm trying to think of them. I, I, I don't know the numbers offhand. I know that this company, Boston Taxi, has 300 caps, I think. And there's like something like five or six major taxi providers in Boston. I would guess the number is a small number of thousands of cabs in a city like Boston. But uh, so I think my, my guess is, of course, Boston, like um, many cities, has an urban, the urban core of Boston is pretty densely trafficked by cabs, right? Like, it's not the case, it's, you know, if you go on the outlier, you know, out, out in the suburbs, you'd never see a cab if you stood in the street, but if you stand on, you know, on Mass Ave at, you know, seven at night, you would probably see, you know, 30% of the cars you see are probably taxi cabs, right? Because they're taking people to and from restaurants and bars and stuff. So in that sense, I think there are certain times of day where you could use taxis to effectively, you could do peer-to-peer -peer networking effectively with taxis. And um, I think it's very interesting to actually understand the question of what density would you need? Even just a answering the question of what density do you need to of these kinds of cars in order to be able to do peer-to-peer -peer networking is interesting. It's actually interesting to ask the question, what density of cars do I need to be able to observe traffic, get a traffic update about every road once every 15 minutes, right? Like how many cars do I need on the road in order to be able to do that? And the answer is non-trivial because of course the cabs don't, cars don't move according to a uniform distribution at all, right? So you can't just assume that because cars travel 100 kilometers of road a day that, you know, use that to easily interpolate or you need to sort of figure out how many, how many miles of road to drive on, how many cars you would need. 
Other questions? Okay, thanks, you guys. Thanks.